Greetings, friends. How's everybody doing? <clears throat> and uh, we're going to be starting another reading um, of another little booklet. Um, and the title of this booklet is Simon Peter versus Simon the Sorcerer or St. Peter Meets the Competition. And this is a study that was put together by an individual named E.L. Martin, Dr. E.L. Martin. Um, but this is going to be this is this is going to be a lot different than the previous reading we did because in this reading, it's not just going to be me reading this booklet because during the course of this reading, it's going to be very it's going to be a very comprehensive and exhaustive study. Yes, I'm going to be I'm going to be reading from this, but there are a lot of scriptures that uh, we are going to be breaking down. A lot of Bible we're going to be breaking down in here. Um, not to take anything from J.A. Wiley, because I just basically did an exhaustive reading of that booklet, The Papacy is the Antichrist. But in this one, um, Dr. E.L. Martin provides us with a lot of scriptures to uh, look at. And we're going to be looking at those scriptures, and we're going to be breaking these down to really get the contrast between Simon Peter... And Simon, which uh, people have coined the phrase Simon Magus, uh, which we're going to get into the word Magus in this study. And what this is, this is important in the aspect of like how Daniel 9 was most important in bringing out it was it was basically the Daniel 9 was the foundation of the gospel of the coming of the Messiah okay Acts chapter 8 you know a lot of people glance over Acts chapter 8 and they'll say oh Simon Magus was a guy that wanted to buy the Holy Spirit you know which you know that's that's true you can't deny that but a lot of people overlook a lot of critique a lot of people fail to critique this and what actually was the Simon Magus. You have, for example, today, you have, you know, the church, the Roman Catholic Church, that claimed that they sit in the seat of Peter, St. Peter. And at the conclusion of the study, you're going to find out that it's not Simon Peter that they sit in the seat of, but it's Simon the Sorcerer. Everything points to this beginning corruption within the church. And this and this counterfeit Messiah doctrine, which started way back as early as Luke wrote the book of Acts. And this was the beginning. This was the beginning. You know, a lot of people like to say, "Oh, the Catholic Church was only only came around in like th in like the fourth century A.D. and under Constantine." No, no, the roots were sowed, the seed was was planted in the very beginning, and so just like Acts or Daniel chapter nine was fundamental in bringing the heart of the Messiah to the world, and its fulfillment of the Messiah at the stoning of Stephen when his spirit came down upon the apostles and they preached unto the Jews for another three and a half years before the gospel went to the Gentiles so and and just as important is Acts chapter 8 a lot of people again they fail to critique this chapter and so we're going to do some of that critiquing here in this video um, so again along with the reading of this book we're gonna be doing a lot of critiquing and there's gonna be a lot of interesting things that are gonna be pointed out regarding Samaria the Samaritans and these types of things to see what the fundamentalism of this supposed first Pope that they claim is Simon Peter okay so we're gonna be going on a little adventure here and Within the book of Acts, specifically Acts chapter 8, because that is the main key foundational passage to determine 
everything that will basically explode this great deception that has befallen the Christian world. And, you know, the Bible says that, uh, you know, we are to expose the unfruitful works of darkness and these types of things. And, and the aspect of knowing your enemy. Well, the enemy is a spiritual enemy, and the spiritual enemy manifests itself in a physical form. Okay, Revelation 13 basically specifically say, states that Satan gives gave him its power, its seat, and great authority. So, in order to understand Satan, you have to understand the physical the the, the physical presence that Satan has allowed this power to have. Plain and simple. You know, um, and see how right from the very beginning Satan was working to push this onto the uh, young church. You know, the the infant church, I guess. You know, you can you can say it that way. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read the forward of this, and after we're done reading the forward, we're going to go into somewhat of an exhaustive study. Um, we're going to go over the key highlights that we're going to be covering in, in this booklet. And then we're going to be going over a study right from the very get-go on a specific word that I wanted to hone in on. And the key and the key question is, okay, is does the Catholic Church have the seed of Peter? Simon Peter, the Apostle Peter. Or is it another Simon, Simon the Sorcerer. And at the conclusion of this series, we will see the obvious of what it really is. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to read the forward of this, and then we're going to read Acts chapter 8. And, you know, because Acts chapter 8, again, is the key text to this whole thing. All right, Simon Peter versus Simon the Sorcerer, or St. Peter meets the competition. This is the forward. This is a great expose by the late Dr. E.L. Martin. It documents the true history of the Samaritans, the meaning of the word Peter in the ancient world, and the church, quote-unquote, that was established at Rome by Simon the Sorcerer. And he goes on to quote Acts 8, chapter 9, verse 24. We're not going to go there just yet, so I'm going to continue right down. And he continues and says, after reading Acts chapter 8, 9 through 24, which we will read in just a minute, right from, right from the very beginning, Satan had his counterfeit Messiah, operating right in the true Messiah's backyard. Right from the very beginning, okay? Satan had, Satan had his counterfeit Messiah. You want to know your enemy? You got to understand a counterfeit Messiah. If you don't understand a counterfeit Messiah, you're not going to know your enemy, period. It's just that simple. Satan had his counterfeit Messiah operating right in the true Messiah's backyard. His name was Simon Magus, or Simon the Sorcerer. And this man, and not Simon Peter, the apostle, went on to found the universal, or Catholic, Roman Church. His career was the history of Roman Catholicism in miniature. For a long time, he bewitched the people with his false miracles since the year 800 A.D., Rome has bewitched the world with her false miracles of transubstantiation. Simon believed and was baptized. Outwardly, he was a Christian. That's very interesting because uh, the Bible speaks about having a form of godliness but denying the power. Okay. Outwardly, he was a Christian, but his belief was only superficial, and he was still a pagan at heart. He coveted the apostolic office and saw the opportunity of using Christianity, Christianity to make money. Sounds like indulgences, doesn't it? A business corporation masquerading as the Church of Christ. From Simon Magus, we get the word simony, which means to buy a religious office with money. After his encounter with St. Peter, this magician went to Rome and, by tricks and false miracles, established a Christian church, quote-unquote, in that city. 
This man can truly be considered as the first of the age-long dynasty of popes, many coming in Christ's name and deceiving many. We get that in, Acts, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 5, so let's go ahead and read that right now. Matthew 25, verse 5. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. That word Christ is another word for the word Messiah, or anointed one, or saying, I am anointed, and shall deceive many. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. This is the very first thing that Jesus answered when <clears throat> the disciples asked, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? And of the end of the world. Okay. So the very first thing was deception. Okay. The very first thing. And this happened right at the very beginning. Not too long after. Jesus Christ. Offered himself. To be the atoning sacrifice. The one and only perfect sacrifice. Not too long afterwards, you had deceivers. And Simon Magus is, quite frankly, the biggest deceiver in the early church. And that spirit carries on to this very day. Okay? As in the case of Patrick and Palladius, the archfiend... Satan took advantage of the similarities in the names to supplant one with the other. We can be sure that Palladius took a big sack of gold with him when he set out for Hibernia. History does not record the encounter between the Roman and the Briton, but we can be sure that St. Patrick told him the same thing that St. Peter told Simon Magus. To hell with you and your money for trying to buy the gift of God. Okay, so let's go ahead and read Acts chapter 8. And we're going to read Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 1, and we're going to read to verse 24. Okay, so Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul, this is before his conversion, was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Except the apostles. Okay, except the apostles. The apostles remained where? In Judea, in Jerusalem. And devout men carried Stephen, and that's very important to make note of, because you have an, an instance of... Um, when it talks about Peter being in Babylon, when he talks about that, folks, that's physical. That's literal. That is not a spiritual Babylon he's talking about there. Um, because Samaria, as we will see later in this series, um, actually, you know, the Samaritans were actually tribes that came from Babylon to settle in the northern part of Judea. Okay, the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay, so... When he says that he was in Babylon, that is a very geographical state. Okay, that's not, you know, talking about mystery Babylon or Jerusalem being Babylon or any of these things. Okay, so that's very important. So again, and Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial, okay, it was after he was stoned, and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hauling men and women committed them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with, loud, with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, and were healed. 
And there was great joy in that city. Which city? Samaria. Okay, now here is here is the key portion of this uh, chapter here. Uh, verses from verse 9 to 24 that we're going to be honing, on, honing in on throughout this entire series. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery. Okay, so Simon is connected with sorcery. And bewitched the people of Samaria, you know, bewitched meaning that they, they caused them to wonder with amazement of this man. Okay, they wondered. Giving out that himself was some great one. Okay, was some great one. To whom they all gave heed, <clears throat> so they all followed this man, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. Okay. The great power of God. This man, this Simon the Sorcerer, Simon Magus, is, his, is, is the great power of God. So what does that tell you? Well, isn't there a power on earth that claims to have this great power of, of God? Okay. You, you, I mean, you see the connections right there already. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed, Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wandered. With amazement. Okay. <clears throat> Does this mean Simon Magus was converted? Well, we're going to find out. Beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So, you know, right now we're, we're starting to get the origins of counterfeiting here. A counterfeit Christian system. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost, these people of Samaria. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Okay, so was Simon's conversion real? Did he play the part of a Judas? Did he play the part as being one of them? Most certainly he did. But here's... Here's this little... Inkling of error here. He offered them money. Saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Can you kind of see the whisperings of Satan saying the same thing to the apostles that he said to Christ when he was being tempted in the wilderness and said, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world if you would just bow down and worship me. I will give you money. Okay. You can kind of see the contrast here. So when Simon saw that through laying out of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> and we see a lot of the simony or simony permeating through all the quote unquote Protestant churches in this world today, don't we? But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. But Peter said unto him, now, now question, here in verse 20, Peter states to Simon, thy money perished with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. And the aspect of indulgence, what was that about? You can, you can obtain salvation for your lost loved ones who are burning in purgatory if you would just give coin and drop it into the box, that makes, when it makes a clinging sound, that's the soul's 
that you are delivering from purgatory up into heaven. This is the same thing. But so how can Rome claim to claim the aspect that the apostle Peter, mind you, was the first pope? Now, just by reading that verse alone, who do you think the real first pope was? It had to have been Simon Magus. Because this is the beginning of indulgences right here. But people, but Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. He wanted to seek the apostle, the apostleship office, the office of the apostleship. He wanted to seek to be an apostle. He wanted to be an apostle. Okay. That's why Peter says, Thou hast neither nor neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps that thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness. That's a very, very interesting phrase that Peter used. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these sayings which ye have spoken come upon me. Okay, and then that's basically, that's basically all that's left, you know, to be discussed there. Um, so let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and move up to verse 9. And let's look at this phrase, great one. Okay, where verse 9 says, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Okay, and these people believe that they, that he, that this man is the great power of God. But this man sits in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God, okay, that this is the great power of God. <clears throat> Sounds eerily similar, doesn't it? And just sake of how long ago this was. All right. So let's go ahead and look at this phrase, great one. This phrase, great one, comes from the Greek, and it means megas. Or Magus. This is where we get Simon Magus. Simon the Great One. Simon Magus. And it's the Greek word in your uh, concordance, number 3173. Okay, and the definition, which means great. And it can be of the external form or sensible appearance of things or, or of persons. In particular, of space and its dimensions as respects mass and weight, great. Compass and extent, or large or spacious, measure and height, or measure and height, long, or stature and age, great or old, of number and quantity, numerous, large and abundant, of age or the elder. This is a very interesting phrase here, the elder. Just this past September, when Pope Francis was uh, visiting the U.S., when he came to the U.S., he made he gave a sermon at St. Patrick's Cathedral. Okay, and uh, we all know about what he said about his uh, the the um um that the cross. That Jesus' life ended in failure, the failure of the cross. Okay, we we all know a lot of people were have been exposing that. I may I even made a video about that. But there is also something else that he said here, and this 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 little sentence here that he quoted. He says, "I know that as the presbyterate in the midst of God's people." Okay. Now, when you look at Second Thessalonians two, it states that he sits in the temple of God. When you look at the aspect of the temple of God, you realize that this is a spiritual temple. They're ta Jesus is talking about the church. You are the temple of God and these types of things. So he is sitting in the midst of God's people, claiming to be God and these types of things. <clears throat> that word presbyterate, we can get the definite 
definition even on Google, which means presbyter, it means a member of the governing body of an early Christian church, okay, or a member of the order of priests and churches having episcopal hierarchies that include bishops, priests, and deacons. Okay. And in the 1828 dictionary, it states, in the primitive Christian church, an elder, this is what the, this is what being a presbyterate means, it means being the elder, a person somewhat advanced in age, who had authority in the church, and whose duty was to feed the flock over which the Holy Spirit had made him overseer. Now, does the office of the papacy claim to have authority in the church? Does he claim to feed the flock over which the Holy Spirit had made him overseer? Absolutely. <clears throat> and in Revelation 13, we read that Satan is the one that gave him his seat and power and great authority. So obviously, this must not be the Holy, the true Holy Spirit that made him overseer of the church. But yet here he is sitting in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. He, he is claiming to be the presbyterate. He's claiming to be the elder. And all this stems from the root word, magus, which Simon got his nickname, Simon Magus. Not Simon Peter, not the Apostle Peter, but Simon the Sorcerer, Simon Magus. Okay, let's go further. It also can be used of intensity and its degrees with great effort of the affections and emotions of the mind, of natural events, powerfully affecting the senses, violent, mighty, and strong. Okay, this is that same uh, Greek definition. Let me re repeat that. <sighs> Magus can be used of intensity and its degrees with great effort of the affections and emotions of the mind, Okay, just remember when he, when when the Pope was here, and I'm not talking just this single Pope because the Antichrist system is the whole dynasty of Popes from the first Pope all the way to the last. But let's look at the current one. When he was here, didn't he have a play on emotions? Look at how he's being received in the world today. Isn't this the affections and emotions of the mind of natural events? You know, you hear this natural law a lot, powerfully affecting the senses, violent, mighty, and strong. This is a violent, mighty, and strong office. Okay, and again, this 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 stems from the word Simon Magus. So where does the root of this counterfeit Catholic or this counterfeit quote unquote Christian system comes from? It comes from all the way back to the Acts of the Apostles that Luke so graciously gave us in the 8th chapter of Acts. And so when you hear with the epistles of Paul declaring uh, verses such as, you know, they had a form of godliness but denied the power thereof. Um, you know... Uh, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Um, you have uh, the Apostle John in the Revelation, which speaks of those who say that say they are apostles and are not, but do lie, um, and these types of things. So obviously, when the early church and the early apostles and the disciples of Christ were preaching. They already knew what was going on. And all of this stems from this incident right here in Samaria with Simon Magus. And it continued all the way up to, pre to the present day. It could also mean pre predicated of rank as belonging to a person's eminent for ability, virtue, authority, and power. authority and power 
Things esteemed highly for their importance of great moment of great weight, importance, a thing to be highly esteemed for its excellence, or excellent, splendid, prepared on a grand scale, or stately, great things. This is a very key phrase here. Great things, which can mean either of God's preeminent blessings, or of things which overstep the province of a created being. Or of things which overstep the province of a created being, proud, presumptuous things, full of arrogance, derogatory to the majesty of God. I need to emphasize this. So this meaning of magus could have two different aspects. So I don't want people to come up to me, well, this same root word is talking about something that's good, you know, that applies to God. Well, yes, it can have that, you know, it can have that attribute, that word can have that attribute in certain verses, and it's in there, okay? Because this could be great things of God's preeminent blessings, or of things which overstep the province of a created being, that's proud, presumptuous things, full of arrogance, derogatory to the majesty of God. We're going to be looking at this right here. So, when we see this phrase, great things, I want you to look at this real quick. Again, this all comes from the root word, magus, which is applied to Simon the sorcerer. So, but there was a certain man called Simon great one Simon Magus okay <clears throat> so let's go ahead and see where we find this phrase great things because we do find it in Revelation 13 verse 2 we read and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority that word great is the same word magus that we find here in Acts chapter 8. And let me look at, let me take you to the word authority. Remember what we saw here. Predicate of rank as belonging to persons, persons, plural. So this is an office, eminent for ability, virtue, authority, and power. And here we see that word power and authority in between the word great, the word magus. <clears throat> Three verses later in Revelation 13, verse 5, we read, And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking what? Great things. So you see the connection? Great things. It's the same root word that belongs to Acts chapter 8, and that is referenced magus. And you can see it right here. Great things. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. So, again, just for the aspect that the dragon, which is Satan or that old serpent, the dragon or Satan, the devil, gave him his power and his seat and his great magus. His, and Magus authority, great well, great one, great authority. And Revelation 13, 5, and it was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Okay, again, Ephesians talks about, yes, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against, but we, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So this is a spiritual war. But again, you have to remember that you can't physically see into the spiritual, but God does give us the ability to understand the enemy through his physical, through his physical agent that he gave power and his seat and great authority to. That's why if you want to understand and if you want to know your enemy, which the Bible talks about exposing the unfruitful works of darkness, if you want to understand Satan, you have to understand the beast. There is no way around it. I know some people like to try to, uh, you know, 
brush that off and say, well, I, you know, I want to understand the devil. Well, if you want to understand the devil, you have to understand the beast. Because it's the devil that gave the beast his power and seed and great authority. And so what? So the actions you see that is portrayed from the beast is going to be the mindset of the devil. And his main focus is deception. <clears throat> and this is... And this deception started as early as... Simon the Sorcerer, Simon Magus. And he was called a great one. He was called the great power of God. And you have to ask yourself, isn't there a power on earth that is doing the same thing? Because he claimed to be part of them. Because again, what does it say? Acts chapter 8 verse 12. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wandered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. And then they... <clears throat> They sent unto them Peter and John, and then when they, when Peter and John came, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. So there were people of Assyria that, that did accept him, but there were also people that accepted him only on an outward sta status. And they said, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, we, yeah, I'll preach Christ and Christ crucified. Yeah, you know, but were they still pagan at heart? Not all of them. I'm pretty sure some of them were 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 fully converted. Because it says who, when they were came down, prayed for them, and they, they that they might receive the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> for as yet he was fallen upon none of them; only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then laid their hands. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Peter said unto him, Thy money will perish with you, because you have thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. And then you have neither part nor lot in this matter. You have no part of the church. You have no part nor lot in this matter of, be, of being an apostle, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. He said the words. He preached Jesus. But he was only doing it for physical gain. And what do we have today? <clears throat> today we have a Simon Magus doing the same exact thing. Acting as part of the Christian church. Acting as a head apostle of the church, acting at a as a presbyterate of the church, sitting in the midst of God's people, but yet he is a Judas priest. He is a son of perdition, and the dragon gave him his power and great authority. It all stems from Simon Magus. So this is what I have for you in this study here. This is basically, I mean, it's a long introduction, but it's an introduction regardless. And when I come to you next in this series, we will be going into the first section of, uh, of um, Simon Peter versus Simon the Sorcerer. So until next time, truth be told, truth be known, stay safe. God bless. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.